truly believe in the magic. What's up, Magic fans? Welcome to Penny for Your Thoughts. Uh, this is episode 82 with Orlando Magic UK's weekly podcast. Um, I'm joined, as always, by Mr. Mikey Clark, who's wearing what seems to be a rag. What is there anything going on this week, Mike? It's called the Champions of Europe t-shirt, mate, from uh, 2019. Hopefully we get to replicate that on a uh, Saturday evening when uh, the Red Men take on Real Madrid. Are you but confident? We shall see. I am confident. We, we had a little bit of a, a disappointment last week, losing the Premier League on the last day of the season. But with a, a good six days rest, and hopefully we can get Thiago and Fabinho back fit for tomorrow night. I think we've just got about enough to beat Real Madrid and we and we owe them for uh, losing in 2018 when uh, Sergio Ramos decided to rip Salah's shoulder out of his socket or try to. And a certain Mr. Gareth Bale, Cardiff boy, scored two. Who's now signed for Cardiff, hasn't he? That's what you, t- I'm sure you told me no, that or somebody was no, telling there's, me that. There's, there's, there's rumours, there's rumours. Oh, it's not I, true I, yet. Not true yet. Not true yet. No. <laughs> well, good luck to you. You've probably got every chance to win tomorrow. So, uh, and um, Mr. Gary, you've had a successful week with with the football as well. Yeah, very enjoyable. Um, I would do that every week if I could. Um, I wouldn't fancy the eight-hour traffic jam trip back, but everything else was grand. Excellent, mate. And you're looking forward to playing the big boys next season. Well, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing Sunderland and Cardiff and Vincent Tan unveiling Gareth Bale on the pitch. It'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good stuff, mate. It'd be, uh, it'd be good if you come down and maybe we can do like a home and away trip. That'd be so, um, yeah. And, and we're delighted to welcome back to the show Mr. Neil Piper, who is a Sheffield Wednesday fan. So uh, maybe we shouldn't go there seeing as Sunderland did play Sheffield Wednesday. But uh, how, how are you, Neil? You good, mate? Well, yeah, other than the recent football, yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Anytime, anytime. Right, let's kick things off then. No, actually, before we do, before you, as you can all see, um, Paul's actually missing from the podcast tonight. So just a word from me on behalf of the Orlando Magic UK community uh, to Paul and his family. Uh, you're all in our thoughts at this difficult time. Obviously, he's had a family bereavement. Uh, and we're looking forward to having you back on the podcast very shortly, mate. So take care of yourself and we'll see you soon. So magic news. There wasn't really any magic related news other than what you get of the um, coverage of, you know, what people think who will, dra- who will draft in the forthcoming draft. But uh, the NBA did announce on Tuesday that a regular season game will be returning to Europe. Uh, next January on the 19th when the Chicago Bulls and a certain Nick Vucevic will be facing the Detroit Pistons uh, in Paris. So I, I, I received an email from NBA UK, so I'm sure uh, a lot of you probably did also. If you haven't, uh, I'd suggest you maybe go on to nba.com forward slash UK and there'll probably be some sort of uh, place there to register for your interest uh, when the tickets do become available. Right, so then, um, as I've stated before, welcome back, uh, return guest, Neil, um, who always keeps a very close eye on prospects, and he and I always have a, have a few uh, conversations for the course of the season. Um, just to get his insights on the NBA draft, given that we secured the first pick last week. So, Neil, um, firstly, what are your thoughts on the season that's been? Um, maybe that stood out for you um, and any glaring needs that you could see on the Magic roster, mate? Uh, well, I think when you make the moves that we made at the trade deadline, the season before the one that's just passed, you, you know, your aims for the season that we've just had changed, really. Um, obviously, under Steve Clifford, we, went, we were trying to win and trying to get into that bottom end of the playoffs. Um, but I think when you make those moves, you kind of have to take the wins and losses out of it and um, mm-hmm. focus on, for me, trying to move forward with finding one, two, maybe three pillars of the team who are going to be part of your core mm-hmm. moving forward. So I think when you look at last season, 
from that perspective, it was actually quite a successful one. Um, you know, the emergence of Franz, uh, Wendell going from a guy who was an inconsistent player with the Bulls to someone who has really found a role with the Magic. Um, so there's those two guys. I think Markel Fultz showed some flashes when he came back. Um, so he started to look at who are we going to go forward with and then who can we potentially take at number one to complement those guys. So overall, you know, obviously not a great season and the basketball was tough to watch at times. But, uh, you know, I think there's some optimism on the horizon and uh, it's a good time to be a Magic fan. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and do, do you think there's somebody in the draft that could, you know, solve our needs instantly or...? I don't think... Well, I think... Um, in terms of solving our needs, I certainly getting that number one pick gives us access to the these top three guys. Um, you know, you've got Chet Holmgren, Jabari Smith, Paolo Banquero. Those are the three that are, people are talking in around that 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 number one pick. And the Magic get to make that choice. So, you know, it'll come down to interviews over the next few weeks, uh, working these guys out, getting to know them a bit. Um Everything that, that I've read about all three of them seems to suggest that they're good characters and, you know, good team players. Um, so I definitely think there's an opportunity for one of them to come in and help. Um, I don't think we're going to see the bump that we might have seen, you know, like back in the day when we drafted Shaq um, or even when we when we got Penny. Um, but yeah, you know, they're certainly, they are going to help us because they're going to meet a need which we've currently got. Excellent. Well, what have you seen watching college basketball this season, Neil? Is uh, is there anyone who stands out for you? Is Chet seems to be probably just edges it for a lot of people as, as the number one guy. Is he yours? Well, Chet has been the number one guy. He was up, up until round about Christmas time. Then uh, Jab- Jabari Smith started to um, emerge. I think the thing about Chet is people are obviously concerned about his frame. Um, Concerned a little bit about the fact, I mean, you look at his pure stats, he's 60% field goal percentage, 39% from three. Those do take a bit of a dip when he's playing a better level of competition. Um, the conference that Gonzaga are in, that's the university that he plays for, uh, is not a particularly strong one. Um, so whether that matters that his numbers take a dip or not, people obviously are going to make a judgment on that. Um He's not, for me, he's he's slightly under my top guy, who is the guy I previously mentioned, uh, Jabari Smith. Um, Jabari, for me, I think is is going to meet our biggest need, which is shooting, spreading the floor. Uh, I think he's a guy that can complement the players that we've got on the roster already. Um, and he's a little bit less of a risk. A lot of what you read about him is that his floor is the highest, so essentially when people say that, what they mean is that even if he doesn't meet the potential that he's got, you're still getting a really good NBA player. I've seen the Rashad Lewis comparison thrown around. I mean, he's one of my favourite Magic players of all of all time. But I think that what made Rashad as good as he was for Orlando was obviously having Dwight Howard in the middle. So, you know, you wouldn't necessarily build a team with Rashad as your best player. And I think that's that's the case probably with um, Jabari Smith, but he certainly can be a, a big, big piece. Um, and that's what you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, am I the only one who's really concerned about Chet's frame? Are you are you concerned, Neil? I am. Well, I think the thing about Chet is when people look at his frame and they're comparing to the likes of like Yanis and KD, um, even Dwight when he came into the league, but you could tell from those guys, like their frame and their shoulders, that there was obviously scope for them to build uh, muscle. Obviously, yeah. in the in the case of Dwight and Giannis, you know, they've built up a lot. Um, whereas Chet has that very narrow, skinny frame. Um, I mean, whether it's going to affect him in the NBA or not, it's hard to say because he's not. He's, he isn't going to be posting guys up. He isn't going to be, you know, taking on the likes of uh, Joel Embiid. Um, that's not really his role. He's more of a perimeter guy. And we've got Wendell Carter to take those guys in, in the middle. I know that Wendell took on that challenge last season. I think he asked uh, Coach Mosley to be the guy to take on guarding uh, Embiid when we played the Sixers. So 
yeah, I, I, I'm not. I am concerned about the frame, but more from an injury side of things. You know, mm. Obviously, we're all we've suffered through the Jonathan Isaac saga, if if you like, for the past two years. Um, and I don't think Magic fans really want to go through that again. There's no, there's not a history with Chet from the injury side of things. But then there wasn't really a history with Ji either. Um, so there is that risk there. Um, like I say, for me, Chet's just under uh, Chabari, but I can understand why people are concerned about his frame for sure. Yeah, it's it's the weight it's the weight difference I'm concerned about. I mean, if you look at Chet now, I think he's what 195 pounds, and you compare yeah. that to like Evan Mobley, who was about 215. If you look at KG when he was a rookie he was about the similar sort of weight same same with uh, Kevin Durant as well Kevin Durant now i think is about 240 he's put on a good 20 25 pounds and for me if like Chet's got that disadvantage of having a very frail slim frame in that he's not going to be able to put on a lot of weight anyway because he's genetically not going to have that in his favor Maybe him hitting the sort of weight that they these guys were as rookies is probably about his ceiling in terms of how much he could possibly put on. He's got sports science. He's got like the best strength and conditioning coaches and diet plans and all these sorts of things in his favour. Um, more than like you or me would be able to do on a on an average week. But um, yeah, I, I'm I'm a bit worried how much. How, like I said, it's, you brought it up, mate. It's it's the injury prevention side of it more than the actual strength and being able to bang and uh, and go against some of these bigger players week in, oh, night in, night out every week. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting, but yeah, we should we should we shall see how much weight you can put on because that's a big a big question mark at the moment. Yeah, the only the only thing I'll add to that is Chet uh, this week sort of came out in, in an interview and he said he keeps being listed as a centre just because of his height primarily and he you know he turns around and says I'm not a centre uh, and you know he's a he's a power forward essentially isn't he so having a seven foot two very skilled uh, tall and lanky power forward who can you know shot <coughs> uh, be a pest and. Uh, you know, he's just a nightmare for the other team on offense. Having somebody that sort of freakishly big um, out on the floor for us, you put put him in with you know Wendell Carter, who do the the center's job, and we get Jonathan Isaac back to to how good he was defensively. We could be very very scary. Um, so I mean, I mean, we'll touch upon it in a second. Who's everybody's pick? I wasn't on the podcast last week, but. Chet's my guy, uh, and, and I'm sure it is Gary's as well. From the smile on his face, <laughs> <laughs> couldn't possibly reveal spoilers, mate. Uh, <laughs> I would, I would look at it though as well. We're talking about the weight issue. If I, if I was going purely off physique, there is a case for Bancaro being the actual the guy. Then, if if you're going off ability to bang, NBA ready body, NBA ready frame, There's, I've seen on my Twitter timeline a, a, a lot of people starting to like swing over to Bancaro and, and Thunder fan I know as well he's very much locked in saying he, if if the magic take Chet at one he's kind of swayed from taking Jabari um, to taking Bancaro so what was your thoughts on that big guys? Well I think the thing about Paolo is if you want a guy who can win you the game uh, with a, with a, you know a last second shot, then he's he is the guy to draft. You know Chet and Jabari aren't necessarily going to do that. Mm. Both those guys are not the shot creators that um, Paolo is. Um, they're not the offensive forces that Paolo is. And Paolo does does it. I know a lot of draft analysts say don't pay any attention to what goes on in the March Madness tournament, but I've always thought that well this is going to be the biggest stage that these guys have ever played on. So it's worth seeing how they perform with that pressure. Like Jabari's last college game was awful. His shoot, I think he went one, one of eight from three. And he kind of showed his biggest weakness, which is if he's not knocking down the shots, he's not, his defense is good, but on the offensive side, if he's not knocking down the shots, he's not bringing an awful lot more to, to the, to the party. Whereas with Paolo, 
He does create for others. Uh, he can score in a variety of ways. His three-point shot looks like it is improving. It certainly improved over the season. Um, but the issue with Paolo is, yeah, he might get you 25 points a night, but the guy he's guarding might score 30. Um, and my worry with him in terms of the magic is Wendell is already a bit undersized. I think he makes up for it with his passion and his strength. He's got great upper body and lower body strength. But then you're drafting another guy, 6'10", to play that forward role. Um, I think just Wendell, for me, is much better alongside a sort of 6'11", 7-foot uh, perimeter guy. Now, whether that's Jonathan Isaac, whether it's Chet, whether it's uh, Jabari Smith, all those three guys fit that mould in a way that Paolo doesn't. So um, I think our offensive rating would certainly go up if we drafted Paolo, but I think our defensive rating would would go down. And, and to me, I don't know if he's a type of player who can massively improve on that end of the floor. Okay. Um, I, I've watched a few Duke, Duke games, uh, obviously, in the uh, March Madness. Uh, and for me, Bancaro, when he was on the floor, you know, he was head and shoulders above anybody else on, on his team, on the opposition. Um, so he comes from good pedigree. Do you think that's important um, that, you know, given he's come from a good college, um, that, that we've seen a bit more of him? Um, I, I know we'll probably come on to talk about a couple of other guys who, you know, haven't played in, in, in college. Um, so how important is that, do you think, Neil? Well, the the Duke thing is a is a bit of a funny one because for years, um, players drafted from Duke were generally seen as actually not living up to the hype that they had coming into the NBA. So going back to the 90s, you had uh, Christian Leitner, who was one of the best players in college. He had a pretty average NBA ca- uh, career based on what people thought he would have coming into the league. Um, Elton Brand went number one. Um, and, you know, again, good career, but you wouldn't say he was a guy, well, he could, obviously no one built a championship team around him. Um, I think Jason Jason Tatum with the Celtics has started to change that narrative about Duke a bit um, in terms of them producing more sort of NBA superstar-like players rather than just solid NBA players. Um, so I think it's important in the sense that if, you, if you're playing for a college like like Duke or like North Carolina, you are playing top teams week in, week out. Um, so that certainly lands in Paolo's favour. Um, but then you can say the same about uh, Jabari Smith, you know, Auburn in the SEC, that's another good uh, conference. So he's certainly playing good competition most weeks. Um, it is important and it isn't, but then at the same time, somebody like Damian Lillard went to a small college, played in a poor conference and obviously you know he's an all-star arguably a superstar so sometimes quite often with the draft people are just sort of taking the best ed- educated guess that they can um and i guess we'll see that again this year it's interesting when you said that neil because um an account i was following on twitter was talking about uh chet and it made the comparisons of chet to what Leitner got when he was coming out. So, the, you know, Leitner was on the dream team, wasn't he? And he got the, yeah. he got the talk of being the, the best white player, American basketball player since Larry Bird. And that was the hype behind him. And then a video I saw the other day linked into a Twitter account was saying that, you know, Chet Holmgren will be the best white American basketball player produced since Larry Bird. And therefore he should be the consensus number one. And it's an incredible weight um, a comparison to carry on your shoulders but it's interesting that that's followed him with Gonzaga whereas the classic Duke picks etc aren't panning out as they used to and as you rightly said guys like Lillard and you can even make that argument for Steph Curry I think he came in from somewhere like Davison wasn't it? Or, Davison yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right yeah. Awesome. yeah look at what he's done there so it's a pretty good scouting system going on for some teams I mean I think the thing about Chet is if I if you gave any GM his stats and they weren't allowed to actually look at the player and you didn't show him his weight, but you gave him all the rest of his stats in terms of his points per game, his, his block rate is huge, then they'd just be like, this is a clear number one pick. 
Uh, it, so, but then he said, "Well, the guy's seven seven foot," and then you showed him the weight, one ninety five. Then they were like, "Oh, hang on a minute," you know. So he actually weighs less than Jaden Ivey, who is a six three six four guard. Um, so, but you're absolutely right. I think the way that I see Chet is he's the type of guy who keeps a GM his job for the next ten years, or he loses a, a GM his job pretty quickly. Um, it's I was speaking to um, another Magic fan recently prior to the lottery and we were sort of saying that it's a type of draft where if you got the number two or three pick you, you then you'd be quite pleased because you're taking the decisions being taken out of your hands mm-hmm. you know if anyone who takes Chet at two if it doesn't work out they're not going to be criticised for it if you take Chet at one and he doesn't work out and Jabari goes two and he becomes an all-star then obviously that's an issue mm-hmm. How tall do you think Chat is? Because I saw a photo of him uh, standing next to David Robinson, and David Robinson's a big bloke. Unless he started shrinking, you know, he's good seven foot. Chet's got to be seven two, seven three. Well, the, I mean, the, the other thing about Chet is he sort of slumps over. He doesn't have great posture. So I think if he's, you know, straight <laughs> straightened himself out a bit, it probably had a little bit more, but. Um, I mean that that that's the other thing, you know. He's only he's only just turned twenty, so he could possibly grow. We saw Jonathan Isaac grow, I think, between his age twenty one and twenty two season. So, um, yeah, that's pretty crazy to think that he's he's lighter than Jaden Ivy. I mean, he's certainly lighter than me, <laughs> and I'm only six of one. I want to the I want to know is he lighter than you guys as well? Hey, do you want to yeah. reveal that on the podcast? G? Probably He's, is, yeah. yeah. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll have to work out what I am in pounds. I've got 20 pounds. Five. you got 20 pounds on him. Out. I've got 25 pounds on him. Yeah. So. Uh, it's, just t- it's touch and go with me, probably. No, I'm, what is it? 14 pounds in a stone, is that right? Yeah. 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 Let me do my, let, let me do my, since I'm a math, a math teacher, I better do a little bit of maths here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's got um uh, what one, one forty eight, one forty nine, something like that. Ten and a half. What, what are you five foot five now? Hey? Five foot five. No, no I'm, I'm doing just, weight. I'm, I'm just winding <laughs> you up, mate. I'm just winding <laughs> you up. <laughs> Good times. So, what what sort of impact do you think the three players might have for the Magic, to, depending on which way we go in the draft, given? the success we've had in with previous number one picks in, in the past with Dwight Howard, Shaq, and obviously making that trade for Penny as well. Well, he, he certainly won't. Whoever you draft is not going to have a Shaq-like impact. Um, you know, Shaq was a, I think, a two or three, I think two-year college player. You know, uh, that particular draft lot, lottery, every team coming to the lottery brought a jersey with... Shaq's name on it. Everybody knew he was going to be the number one pick. He was far and away the best player um, and obviously had an instant impact. I think the Magic went from the worst team in the league to only just missing the playoffs in his first season. Um, so you're not going to get that sort of impact from whoever you draft this year. But I think that, especially with Chet and Jabari, what you're looking for with those two is, are they a sort of piece of the puzzle to help unlock the other players? Um, I've got a bit of a stat here that... Um, in relation to Markel Fultz. Um, Markel Fultz ranks in the 99th percentile for potential assists per 100 passes at 31.9. So essentially what that means is he's towards the top of the league in creating opportunities to score for other players, but his assists don't match that. So what we're saying here is Fultz is getting the ball to guys to score and they're not scoring. And you can tell that from our offensive rating, the three-point shooting from most guys other than the Wagner bros and, uh, you know, the odd hot game from one or two other guys. You know, we rank towards the bottom of the league in that. Um, If you draft Jabari, 42% from three, that should instantly improve. Uh, Chet's 39% from three, not quite the shooter that Jabari is, but again, that's an improvement. And I think the key for me is those guys, defenders are going to have to start paying attention to them. So it opens up lanes for the likes of Fultz, the likes of Suggs, 
Franz Wagner to cut to to the basket rather than uh, defender saying, well, you know, I don't really need to pay attention to whoever that guy is on the perimeter because he's unlikely to score a three. And, and if he does, then I'll live with it. Um, so I do think they can definitely have an impact. They can have an impact in terms of the play that they bring, but also in terms of what they can do to unlock the potential of the team as a whole. I've got a bunch of them here, but I was, the main one I've got written down is is just basically about the uh, the wild card of of Banquero. So also, I would also add to that, is there anybody aside from him who you would actually see making an impact or somebody the Magic want to look at? Well, if the Magic have fallen to four, uh, I'd be looking at Shade and Sharp. Um, he really is the ultimate wild card. Uh, he's not played college basketball. He's not played competitive basketball for over a year. You're basing a lot on what he did on the youth circuit and in high school. Um, but the reality is he's the one player towards this top of this draft who is a wing who can create for himself. His shot looks good. He reminds me a bit of Andrew Wiggins, who obviously I know maybe his career, although I think he's likely to about to hope, hopefully win an NBA title um, in the next few weeks. Uh, no one from the East. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, he is a guy and from what I've read and seen, if he had stayed in college or was going to stay in college this coming year, he'd be a top three pick in next year's draft, which looks like being a really good one. Um, so if the Magic had fallen below three, I'd be looking at Sharp. Uh, I wouldn't consider him for, for number one. Um, the other guy guy that we mentioned earlier, Jaden Ivey, um, some comparisons made to Jar Morant with the Grizzlies. Um I don't think he's quite that player in terms of his assists. His three-point percentage jump from 25% in his first year at college to 35% this current year, which obviously a big jump, but you know, you do wonder, was it an outlier? Uh, would he be able to sustain that in the league? Um, as I said, I don't think he's necessarily the passer, but uh, I don't know. I, I think with the Magic's history and the lottery, you try to talk yourself into these guys that you think are going to come around four, five and six. So the teams around there are going to get some good players, but they're not players who would enter the conversation for number one, for me anyway. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so let's just quickly go around the four of us to see what camp we're in today. Just because, you know, like we've touched upon, um, everyone's flip-flopping uh, every day, really, aren't they? So I think we know where Neil is, but just to confirm, Neil, your team Jabari? Yeah, if the draft was tonight, I would draft Jabari, only just uh, over Chet. Okay, uh, let's go to Gary, who I think has also shown his hand. I would, I would go for Chet, um, due to fit next to Wendell. Okay. And uh, Mr. Clark? <laughs> I'm going to echo Gary's words, but I would say Jabari Smith is a better fit <laughs> next to Wendell. Uh, yeah, for me. I, I think he's more of a seamless fit at, and with Franz Wagner there as well. Um, I do think we're going to go Chet, but if it was my choice, I would go Jabari Smith. Okay. Uh, and I'll split it down the middle and I'll go Team Chet So uh, for this week. So uh, I'm sure we'd have probably changed next week. As uh, a lot of a lot of people do, so no, thank you for that. So, um, so I thought we'd uh, come up with um, some end of season awards. So uh, I've picked a couple of topics. So um, we'll have a little discussion between us. We'll we'll put them out on Twitter. We'll get the community to vote, uh, and then we'll come up with our uh, player of the season, unsung player of the season, and moment of the year. So. Guys, um, I come to Gary first for player of the season. Who is your nominee and why? I had it down to two. Um, the the runner up would be Franz Wagner um, for clear reasons, just for the season he's had. A absolutely immense um, what he managed to do straight out the gates. However, I think especially from February onwards, from the All-Star break, I think I've got to go with Wendell Carter Jr. Um, I think he had a bit of a breakout after the All-Star game. I think he was massively consistent since he was a player I had my doubts about when we made the trade for uh, him with the Bulls. Um, 
But what he's shown, particularly since the All Star break, he, I think he became more aggressive. As we've mentioned already, he started picking up tougher defensive assignments, so asking for Embiid. And I think if he'd had that the entire season, you'd be looking at somebody who was in the talk for the most improved player award in the NBA. So it's Wendell for me. Yeah, solid pick there. I'm sure, you know, end of the day, I think we've all picked about three and we've probably got the same three on our list. But Mikey, who's your who's your second mate to add well, to this list? You know, I'm a massive fan of Wendell, but for me, I, I've got it the other way around from Gary. Franz Vard was my uh, player of the season. Uh, all rookie first team. Uh, he only missed three games all season. Uh, he, he had the quiet preseason and we thought, what have the Magic done picking him at eight? And then the start of the regular season, he'd come out the blocks and uh, really he had the, he had, I'm not even going to give it away actually because we've got another question in a minute. But uh, no, Fra- Franz has been consistent all season, which to do that in your rookie year, um, he was, I think, fourth in scoring in all rookies this season as well. Um, and uh, he's been just as consistent for me as Wendell. Um, I think Wendell's experience has probably helped him a little bit, but for Franz to come in and do what he's done in year one, uh, that's why I would just edge it and give it to Franz. All right, cool. Now, Neil and I have spoken uh, before the before the show, and he and I are probably in um, agreement for the third person. So, Neil, I'll let you take this one, mate. The third person to add for the player of the season? I, th- I think for his play especially during the first half up until Christmas when we had all those guys going down with COVID. Um, it's got got to be cold to be added to that list, I think. The only surprise here is Gary yeah, didn't a... say it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely spot on there. Um, Cole's the third one there for me as well, especially given his... Uh, well, there was one performance in particular, which I'm sure we'll talk about in, in a little bit now. So... Um, next category so we'll, like I said we'll put this all on Twitter we'll have a little vote and uh, we'll announce the winners next week um, unsung player of the season let's come to Mr Clark first that for me is Moritz Wagner um, he, he felt like a bit of a I, I know the Magic signed him at the start of the season but it just felt like a signing just to sort of help Franz bed into the team and I feel like as the season's gone on He's been that spark plug off the bench. He's been that nasty player that likes to get under people's skin. He's annoying. Um, and then as the seasons went on, we've seen him develop the three a little bit. We've seen some some big time dunks from him. Um, he's played in, in 63 games for the Magic this season. Um, yeah, and he's 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 having a, a very good year. And I think next season he's got a non-guaranteed second year, but I think we all expect him to come back and and so he should because he fully deserves uh, the the credit that he's got this season because I don't think anybody were expecting what what we saw from from uh, from Fran uh, for, sorry from Moritz this year. I think I'm fairly sure he's uh, only been paid the league uh, minimum as well. So I think you're right, yeah. The deal is excellent value. You've got to bring him back at that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, I, I'll, I'll chime in with my uh, unsung player. Um, I'll go with Mr. Gary Harris. Now, put my hand up. At the beginning of the season, I wasn't a fan, but he chipped away, knocked down the threes in the corner um, and was a very, very consistent role player um, given you know the transition coming from Denver, averaging 11 points a game, uh, shooting 38% from downtown. Um, I just hope we can bring him back um, on on some sort of you know friendly deal. In that you know it's a short term one. I wouldn't want to lose him for nothing. Um, so yeah, Mr. Gary Harris is my unsung player of the season. Um, Gary, um, runner up will go to Robin Lopez. Um, just for, for the consolation prize, Robin, because I'm sure you're listening to this. 
you do have an invite to Disney with us in October. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm going to give it, I'm going to use my prop I've brought along tonight, my pointing finger. Look at that. <laughs> Point out the uh, Admiral Schofield jersey behind. I'm going with Admiral Schofield. Uh, he's given us, well, he's earned his way onto the roster for starters. Um, and I, I really like having a player who plays with his toughness, his aggression, and it's just about time somebody on the Magic team stood up to Montrez Harrell. So it's, uh, it's Admiral Schofield for me. Awesome. Good stuff. Any, anyone you'd add to that, Neil, or are you in agreement? Uh, no, I think those are the right three. I, I will just give a little bit of special mention to uh, Devin Kennedy, who um, obviously bat- battled back from that awful injury. Um a guy who I really like. I think that he reminds me quite a lot of Seth Curry, who played a bit for the Magic G League or D League team, uh, whichever one it was under the Rob Hennigan days. Um, and obviously, we 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 let Seth slip through our grasp, and uh, he's gone on to become a very serviceable NBA player. And I think that uh, Devin Kennedy could do the same. It's great that he's got a contract that. Uh, I know it's non-guaranteed for next year, but I'm hoping the Magic will guarantee that because um, I think he's the one who could follow a similar. I know he's a bit older; I think he's about 26, 27. But um, you know, I think there's a player in there. Um, so, an honourable mention for him for making his way back. But he's a bit like Absolutely. Wagner, isn't he? He's he's uh, on the league minimum next year. So again, oh, yeah. um, you get a massive va- you get a massive amount of value for uh, that small amount of contract. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the only thing, the only issue is he obviously is unlikely to get much playing time if all the guards are fit, because we do have, have a lot of guards. Um, but maybe for a two-way, again, whether he'd be interested in that, I don't know. I did listen to his recent podcast. He was on the T-Ross podcast. I don't know if you guys mm-hmm. listened to that. Um, and he sounded like a guy ready to take his opportunity to play in the NBA. So... I don't know how much longer he'll going to be willing to play for Lakeland if there's another opportunity somewhere else, but we'll see. Yeah, no, good stuff. Um, and then the last topic I had was moment of the season or the year. So uh, make of that what you will. Um, I'll come to Neil first on that one. Yeah, so probably between two for me. The first one's got to be the the Franz Dunk in Minnesota. Um and I think he scored 38 points on that night as well. So it was relatively early on in, in the season. So it was kind of like his big uh, arrival, if you like, in the league. Um, but I'm probably just going to give it to uh, the Chicago game and um, Jalen Suggs kind of uh, announcing the magic on his chest. And I think there'd been a bit of... Uh, he'd been getting a bit of stick off a Bulls fan behind the basket during that game. So it was just nice to see, you know Uh, because there's been a few times this season let's face it where other teams fans have taken over the Amway and I think we start to see the signs that the Magic are starting to you know announce it's our home court and could get a bit of pride back No definitely I I had that as one of mine as well Uh, yeah like you said 114-95 win Um, Wagner Brothers combined for 41 that day Uh, seven players in double digits and I think we annoyed Stacey King (laughs) <laughs> if I uh, seem to remember rightly and the yeah. UK Chicago Bulls community <laughs> never mind they boys <laughs> um, Gary you didn't think I was going to go all, through all these awards without giving one a call do you um, no chance <laughs> so it's got to be the game in the garden um, where Cole had his family courtside and he absolutely just had like a virtuoso performance Um basically owned Madison Square Garden and then T. Ross came in in the fourth quarter and pretty much outscored the Knicks by himself with a vintage T. Ross performance. So what's not to love? Cole owning the garden and vintage T. Ross. So that's that's my moment of the season. Happy yeah, days. I, I've got that one on my list as well. And, and I've got in brackets, the real garden, none of this Boston nonsense. Yeah, 29 points, 16 rebounds, 8 assists, 110 104 win. I think that was our first win of the season as well, was it? Real. Yeah. Game three. Yeah. I, I think I think that's the night that they renamed it uh, Magic Square Garden, didn't they? Yeah. 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 
Bing bong. They're always been Bing bong, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and Mikey, what's your well, moment of the season, mate? Well, I actually thought Gary was going to go with uh, Cole's moment of the season, which wasn't actually on the floor. It was the uh, the video, I think, on Instagram Live where he was getting an injection. He was just sat in the chair getting pinned down going, ah! <laughs> <laughs> He's, He's box office. Mate, he is box office. He is great. Um, the moment for me uh, has to be, well, the honourable mention is the NBA draft lottery because uh, this year was worth it in the end. Um but yeah, there's there's two for me. Um, same as as Neil mentioned, that win over Chicago, the the dunk from Jalen Suggs, sticking the elbow in DeRozan's face, saying "Get out of the way," and uh, throwing it down and giving the crowd the big one. And then uh, the other one was the uh, Golden State win, where we had the the Twitter meltdown, where uh, we were going to ruin our lottery odds, and uh, actually that's, that might have been the the win that won us number one pick. So uh, yeah, good times indeed. Funny how it works, isn't it? Absolutely. Right. So, so my moment, you've literally got two, three and four for me here on my list. So for my moment of the season it is Markel Fultz's return. And not just that, it's the team camaraderie, uh, the magic socials, you know, the media, everybody coming together. Everyone was wearing Markel Fultz uh, T-shirt jerseys uh, when he was returning to the arena. Um, and then he came out, scored 10.6 assists in a 119-103 win over the Indiana Pacers. Um, you knew this was coming. He's my boy. You know that. I see Gary smiling there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Mark Alfonso has returned for me. Uh, the king. There we go. Right then. Um, would you like some trivia, guys? Wow. I'm going to have to get these quest- uh. questions up again because... And be knowing to some people who, who might not keep an eye on our Twitter. We did record this yesterday. <laughs> and unfortunately, the recording didn't say. So I had some... And the boys did very, very well. They each got one right in a, who am I? So, sorry, boys. Tonight's going to be a bit harder, okay? <laughs> Last night right. was too easy, G. But that's fine. Oh, that's is fine it? by us, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're all in play. First, yeah, started in the NBA in 1997, between 97 and 99, with the Portland Trailblazers. He then played for the Houston Rockets between 99 and 2004. Played for the Orlando Magic between 2004 and 2006. Finished 2006 with the Detroit Pistons and played his final season with the New York Knicks in 06-07. And if you'd like a clue, I can give you a clue. Who did he start with, G? Uh, the Portland Trailblazers, Portland. mate. Okay. And he came to the Magic when? 2004, did you say? 2006. And So it's probably going to be one of the guys that was signed... Not in the off season Kate. that they drafted Dwight. Not, no. No. It's not. I was going to say Cato, but that was a bit later, wasn't it? It was. Calvin Cato would, would be correct, Mr. Oh, is it? Oh, well, Calvin well, Cato. Cato. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. Calvin Cato. Yeah. He, right. was in the, he was in the Steve he Francis was, trade, wasn't he? Yeah, it was Mobley. Mobley was one of the answers last night, wasn't it, boys? It was. It was. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought Kittle was drafted by uh, Houston. So that's he wasn't. Awesome but he, it, in fairness, every time you see Calvin Cato in a uniform, he's always in a Rockets uniform, you know, mm. in images. So, um, right. This is the easiest one of the three, I think. He played between for the Magic between 99-2000. He played for the Los Angeles Clippers between 2000 and 2008. Played for the Golden State Warriors between 08 and 2010. The Milwaukee Bucks, 2010-2011. The Charlotte Bobcats, 2011-12. And then his final season was with the Detroit Pistons in 12-13. So just the season with the Magic. Or in the 
He's got he's got it. I was just gonna say he wasn't drafted by the Magic, he's drafted by the Sonics and Horace. traded for Horace Grant. Yeah, you got it. Solid answer there, Neil. Right. I give you two more if you really want, but one's really hard. Go on. Now. Okay, let's go with the the little bit easier one. Okay. Started in the league in 1983, between 83 and 94, with the Dallas Mavericks. So bear in mind, he's played for the Magic. Okay. He then played for the New York Knicks between 94 and 96. He went back to the Mavericks between 96 and 97. He played for our beloved Orlando Magic in 97 98 Eric Harper he mm. he's got it I didn't even have to say that horrible yellow Sorry. team then no no that's good that's good I didn't have to say their name <laughs> I, I mainly got nice. it because I'm fairly sure isn't Harper the guy that did the pass to Nick Anderson for the winning yeah. three to sink the yeah. Lakers when Shaq's re- return to the well whatever it was called arena back then or the, arena. I think it was TD arena. Waterhouse arena. was it yeah. yeah yeah like March 12th 1997 96, 94, we won. Not that I remember. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Linux, wasn't he? So, yeah. Um, right then. Well, this was probably harder. Uh, started out in the league in 93, 94 with the Milwaukee Bucks. Played then for the Boston Celtics in 94, 95. Then he played for the team that we do not mention. So somebody get it quick. Uh, between 95 and 96, the yellow team. Um, then he played for the Magic between 97 and 2000. Then he played for the Los Angeles Clippers 2000, 2001. Derek Strong? Oh my gosh, he's good, isn't he? He's on he's it. He's good. He's good. I said I'd up my game, was- but I feel like I need to go even harder next time, mate. <laughs> it was the it was the Clippers one because I think he was because they traded loads of guys in two thousand to clear cap cap space to uh, to get Grant and Tracy. That's it, and we traded Corey Maggetti that season as well. Yeah, with yeah, Derek yeah. So um, good work, boys. Yeah, I wouldn't have got those yeah. last two, Not especially the one where you start in nineteen eighty three, and like, I wasn't even born then, so <laughs> I had no hope. <laughs> Uh, well, you learn, mate. You learn. Um, so, um, just a quick reminder: don't forget to sign up for the draft watch party if you haven't already done so. Uh, we'll add the link to the podcast description. Um, so, thank you, gentlemen, as always, uh, and thank you to everyone for listening and watching. Please subscribe to the podcast, and for the latest news, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter all at Orlando Magic UK and visit our website, orlandomagicuk.com. Um, we're all off to buy Real Madrid shirts. So from <laughs> Neil, Gary, Mikey and myself, until next time, go Magic and Hala Madrid. <laughs>